What does it mean that momentum is a vector? Guys, let's think back to the very first day of this class. We talked about what the difference was between a vector and a scalar. Wow, okay. Let's remember then. The difference between a scalar and a vector is a scalar is an amount. A vector is an amount with direction. Yes, with direction, okay? So we don't just talk about momentum in terms of how big it is. We talk about it, how big it is, and what direction is it moving in, okay? That makes a difference in a collision, doesn't it? If I hit something straight on versus I hit it from behind versus I hit it from the side, that's going to make a difference in the final output, isn't it? If two things come together this way versus two things come together this way versus two things come together this way. Think about playing pool. When you play pool, how many of you have ever played a game of pool? Yeah, it's a study in momentum. You can kind of predict instinctively where the ball is going to go based on how you hit it. If you want it to go straight forward, you have to hit it from straight behind, don't you? If you want it to, if your ball, the pocket is over here, but your ball is here, you've got to get it to hit sort of at an angle so it pumps this guy off that way, don't you? That's momentum. You're using this idea of momentum because your brain automatically kind of understands it to a certain extent, doesn't it? So, so it is a vector quantity, which means that it has um, a magnitude and a direction, okay? Has a magnitude and direction. So what is momentum? We use little p for momentum, not big P for power, this is little p. And momentum is considered the mass multiplied by the velocity. That's where it gets its vectors, from the velocity. So mass times velocity. So it is a product, because of its mass, it's a product of inertia. How hard is it to get it to move? And then the velocity is how fast can we get it to move and in what direction? Make sense? All right, so what are the units of momentum? What are the units for mass? Yeah, kilograms. And what are the units for velocity? Acceleration. What's the units for velocity? Meters per second. Yes. So units of momentum are kilogram meters per second. Okay? Now, an alternative is this. Since we know newtons are equal to kilogram meters square or meters per second squared excuse me not meters squared it's newtons are force times acceleration right so force is um excuse me newtons is force which is mass times acceleration so it's kilogram meters per second squared so a kilogram meters per second is the same as saying a newton times the second newton seconds is also the units if you see that all right now, remember I said, it's a product of its mass, so it's inertia, isn't it? So it's how hard it is to get something started, but also how hard it is to get something to stop. So think about this. Momentum can be thought of as how difficult it is to stop an object in motion. Really, we should talk about this in terms of how difficult it is to get something to change its direction. Make sense? Okay, good. So... If two objects have the same speed but different masses, the one with the greater mass is harder to stop. Would you agree with that? I would, yeah. If you, it's easier to stop an ant going 10 meters per second than it is a train going 10 meters per second. Ants easy to stop. It's like in football. Would you rather have to face a little 180 pound running back or a 300 pound guard? 300 pound guard is going to be harder to stop his motion, isn't it? But what do they do in football? See, good football players, like good running backs, know momentum. They know instinctively no momentum. Because what do they do? And they're going fast and they're playing the angles, aren't they? Have you ever seen them? They spin, they bounce off of people to get themselves past, don't they? Because they know they can't win straight on, but they can sort of use their running momentum, their velocity, even though their mass is lower, they get their velocity higher. And there's this trade-off so that they can keep their momentum going past somebody and continue down the field. 
football is a great place to look at momentum, okay? For two objects with the same mass, the one with the greater speed is harder to stop. So if you have two cars going the same, which the same mass, two identical cars, which one's gonna be harder to stop? The one going 10 miles per hour or the one going 30 miles per hour? 30, isn't it? So the one that's faster. So you have to look at this trade-off between mass and velocity, all right? So let's look at this. It says a llama has a mass of 90 kilograms and gallops at two meters per second. An alpaca has a mass of 60 and runs at three meters per second. Compare the inertia and the momentum of each object. So inertia, what does inertia have to do with? Guys, inertia is strictly has to do with their mass. So which one weighs more? Which one has more mass? So which one has more inertia? Okay, so remember this. Inertia has to do with mass, right? So as mass goes up, inertia goes up, doesn't it? So the llama is gonna to wanna to stay in motion more. That's what it means. Remember, inertia has to do with how hard, how hard it is to get something going or keep it going. It's gonna be easier to keep the llama going, isn't it? Because the llama has more mass. However, momentum. Momentum is a product of both its inertia and its speed. So let's compare the inertia, the, uh, the momentum of the llama versus the momentum of the alpaca. So it's mass times velocity, isn't it? So its mass is 90, but its velocity is two. So what is its momentum? Yeah, 180 kilogram meters per second versus the alpaca, which is gonna be what? Its mass times its velocity is 60 kilograms times three meters per second is what? Yeah, it's also 180 kilogram meters per second. So while the llama has more inertia, they both have the same momentum. In other words, the alpaca made up for its lack of mass by going faster. So they have the same momentum. So different inertias doesn't necessarily mean they're one's harder to stop than the other. You can make up for your lack of inertia by increasing your speed. All right, so relate impulse to change in momentum. All right, so impulse is J, okay? So we know impulse is J. So what do we know? Momentum is closely related to force. In other words, we can apply a force for a certain amount of time and an object will change its momentum. I want you to think about this. Let's look at this. We have V final equals V initial plus AT, don't we? So V final minus V initial is equal to AT. Well, what would happen if we multiplied all of this by M? Look what we would have. MV final minus MV initial equals MA times T. Well guys, why did I do this? What is MV? Look up on your paper, what is MV? Momentum. So what we have here and what you're seeing here is you're seeing the final momentum minus the initial momentum. And guys, what is MA? It's force, isn't it? Yep, it's the sum of forces, isn't it? So what we find out is 
MV final becomes momentum final minus MV initial, which is initial momentum, is equal to force times time. Now, in other words, this is the change in momentum. Don't you agree? P final minus P initial is change in momentum. That is equal to force times time. Well, force over time, look what it just said. Force over time. Impulse is a change in momentum that's related, related to force applied over time. So force over time is what we call J. That is impulse. So impulse literally is, the impulse momentum theorem says that impulse is change in momentum. And change in momentum is force over time. Now, what are the units of impulse? Well, what are the units of force? Units of force are Newtons. Units of time are what? Does it not make sense? Newton seconds, didn't we just see that as an alternative to the units up here? Where else did we see Newton seconds? It's the units of momentum. So impulse, which makes sense since you consider momentum or impulses change in momentum, the units aren't gonna change, are they? So it makes sense that the units of impulse are the same as the units for momentum. Kilogram meters per second or Newton seconds, okay? Is everybody good? Anybody have any questions so far? So when I was talking about the impulse, when I was talking about that ball bouncing and on top of another ball, both of the balls beneath it are impar imparting their force to it, aren't they? And going in this direction over a very short period of time. When we talk about impulse, we're talking about a very short period of time. We're talking about a change in momentum. When we bounce a ball off a wall, it goes in in one direction and comes back off in another direction, doesn't it? And it does that change in direction very fast. The, the impact on the wall. Now, the reason why it works is because we have a deformation. It hits the wall, springs down, deforms. If you looked at it very closely with a camera, you would see it deform and then bounce, spring back the other direction. It would go push in and then push back out. So it's in, that in pushing in the wall and then pushing back out is the force that's being applied by the wall over a very short amount of time. You get it? If you have a ball going in, that ball, when it hits the wall, collapses in on itself like a spring collapsing. And then what happens when a spring collapses? It wants to push back out. So it collapses in this way and then pushes back out the other way, which drives the ball back off the wall very quickly. All right? That's the way it works. That's what happens when we bounce the golf ball, which doesn't bounce as high as, say, the bouncy ball. Why does the bouncy ball bounce higher when it hits the floor? Has to do with the material, guys. The material is squishier, isn't it? Rubberier. In other words, it has more spring in it. When it hits the ground, it deforms more. Therefore, it pushes out more when it falls, when it bounces back up. That's why bouncy balls have to be made of this. Whereas golf balls have like rubber bands and baseballs have rubber bands inside. And so they're very springy inside, but there's a hard exterior. They're still got some bounce, say more than the other ball I was using, right? Or even a basketball. Now basketballs, we inflate them. And the more we inflate them, the more they bounce up to a certain point, don't they? Because, and it's not because they're less, they have less flex, it's because they restore better when they're fuller of air, okay? That's why a ball doesn't bounce as well when it's flat. Because it squishes in, but because it doesn't have much air in it, does it bounce back out? Nah, so it just squishes in and stops. 
so it goes away. All right. So if a force F acts on an object of mass M for a time T, what impulse is imparted to the mass? Now it doesn't give us anything, does it? But what do we know about impulse? Impulse is J, what is that equal to? Yeah, no, that's NS, but it's force over, it's F, what? What is impulse? Change of momentum or? F times T. So F times T. That's the impulse imparted to the mass. Right? Okay. What's the change in momentum of the mass? What do we know? You just told me what it was. Change in momentum is also FT, which is impulse. What's the change in speed of the mass? Well, guys, what is momentum? That is going to be mass times what? Change in speed, which is equal to FT, isn't it? So how do I get the speed by itself? Divide by M. So we have our change in velocity is the, is the impulse divided by the mass. Okay? So it's impulse divided by mass. All right. So now, let's see how this affects people. A car abruptly goes from a velocity of 15 meters per second to rest after a collision. Guys, why do we use airbags along with seat belts? This has everything to do with impulse. I want you to picture what happens in a car crash. If you're wearing your seat belt, what happens in a car crash? You keep going, don't you? Your inertia says that you're going forward and you want to continue to go forward, even when the car stops, because you're not physically attached to the car unless you have your seat belt on. So now you have your seatbelt on, so you continue to go forward. What does the seatbelt do? It stops you from going forward, doesn't it? But that can be pretty brutal. Have you ever seen somebody's, the marks on somebody after a car crash, a, a pretty violent car crash? They have huge bruises here. Sometimes it even breaks their sternum. So why do we have an airbag? What does an airbag do? It doesn't just inflate. The seatbelt absorbs the force. The difference is, is that the airbag inflates rapidly and then what does the airbag do? Deflates. An airbag doesn't work right unless it also deflates. It inflates to fill up the space between you and the dash or the steering wheel. And then it begins to deflate rapidly. So while you keep going forward, you don't just hit the airbag. You hit the airbag and then it begins to slow you down. It slows you down more slowly than the seatbelt does. So let's think about this in terms of force. Your change in momentum happens over time, doesn't it? Okay. Power is force over time, isn't it? We learned that already. Power is force over time. So if you take the same amount of force, but you spread the amount of time, as time goes up, because remember, power is force over time. So if the time in the bottom goes up, the force goes down. So the airbag actually slows down how fast you come to a stop. So between it and the seatbelt, airbags are actually more effective at keeping you alive and not bruised because they spread that amount of force out. He said they absorb the force. We kind of think of them as absorbing the force, but really what they're doing is taking that same amount of force and giving you more time to experience it. So there's less power involved, and power is the thing that's gonna hurt your body, okay? Do you have a question? So if the airbag doesn't deflate, is it still good to have the airbag? No, it's like hitting a wall. It's like hitting a wall? Yeah, that's why you have to have your airbags service if your air, if your airbag light ever comes on you don't want the airbag to inflate and then stay inflated it's 
it's like hitting the dash. I mean, it's, it's, it's a hard thing when you're hitting. Wham! Now that'd be worse. You've got to have the airbag deflate as well. If the airbag doesn't deflate, you're in trouble. So yeah, no. So, explain why the airbag is deployed to protect the driver of the vehicle. The increase in time does what? Yeah. So I want you to think about it. The change in momentum is the same, isn't it? Change in momentum is equal to force over time. So as T goes up, F has to go what? Down if the change in momentum is going to be the same. So now, for a defined change in momentum, what do we call it if something goes up and the other thing goes down? What type of proportion is that? Yeah. So the change, the time and force are inversely proportional. An increase in time or a smaller time will require a what? Greater force, yes. To change the object's momentum by a certain amount. For a constant force, more time leads to a greater change in momentum. So if we leave the force the same, so if F stays the same, if you want this to go up, then the other piece has to go up, doesn't it? If we have the same amount of time and we want to increase this, we have to increase our force. That's called a direct proportion, isn't it? So on opposite sides, we've got a direct proportion. For a predetermined time, a greater force will lead to a greater change in momentum. So let's look at example D. Soccer player can apply a force of 30 newtons to a ball with a mass of one and a half kilograms. If the player remains in contact with the ball for 0.7 seconds, and if the ball was at rest when it was kicked. Now notice that really small amount of time. That right there is a hint that you should be looking at impulse. A lot of force over a short period of time. See it? Big force, small amount of time. Those are our hints that it's got to be impulse. How fast will the ball be moving when it leaves the player's foot? So what we want to know is this, and we know it was at rest when it was kicked. So if it was at rest, what does this mean? Its initial momentum was what? What are you saying? Yeah, zero. Its initial momentum is zero, isn't it? Mass times velocity, right? So its initial momentum is what its mass times its initial velocity. This is zero, so the whole thing is zero. So we know its initial momentum is zero. We know we're talking about a force over time, right? So force and time tell us this part right here tells us impulse, which is J, which is force times time. But what else is J equal to? Delta P, right? Change in momentum. So change in momentum. So FT is equal to MV final minus MV initial. We already know this is zero. We just found that, didn't we? So we know the force is what? Time is? We know his mass is 1.5 times his final velocity. So just by knowing how hard he kicked the ball and how long it took, we can figure out what the velocity of the ball is, okay? So what is the final velocity of the ball when it leaves the player's foot? What'd you get? 
14. Okay. Is that what everybody else got? Let's see. 30 times 0.7 divided by 1.5. I think, yep, 14. So it's going 14 meters per second. So far, so good. All right. So let's look at this guy. Find the rebound speed of a one of a half a kilogram ball falling straight down so that it hits the floor, moving at five meters per second. If the average normal force exerted by the floor is 205 newtons for 0.02 seconds. So again, you see this force time thing and you must think impulse. Now this time we have, we have a, ma or a mass, don't we? This is mass. This is our initial velocity, isn't it? Do you see how I'm identifying the pieces? So I know I have impulse. So I'm literally gonna write that thing down again. Impulse is force times time which is equal to change in momentum. Change in momentum is what? MV final minus MV initial. So now we can fill in all the things we know and solve for what's left, can't we? So the force was 205, the time was 0.02, mass is half times the final velocity minus half a kilogram times the initial velocity. Is that what everybody got? Final velocity is 13.2. Yes? No? Two oh five times 0 0.02, right? Plus 2.5 gives me 6.6 .6, divided by 0 0.5. I got 13.2. Ah, uh, yeah, 0 0.02, be careful. Okay. Here's my question. Does that sound right? Should it be going faster? If we just drop a ball, does it go faster on the way back up? What happens as we bounce a ball? Because I made this mistake on purpose. Is it gonna bounce as high the second time? It's the same mass. So if it doesn't bounce as high, what does that say about its velocity? It has to be what? Slower. goes a little bit less high every single time, doesn't it? So what did I do wrong here? So remember what we said? We said this has to do with vectors, doesn't it? So don't, not only do we have to take into account vectors, 
We have to take into account that both. So where should I, where did I mess up here? The five should have been a what? Negative. That five should have been a negative. So we've got to put it in as a negative, which means that it's going to change this answer, isn't it? So instead of adding 2.5, I'm going to 205 times 0.02. minus 2.5 divided by 0.5 is actually what? 3.2 meters per second. That seems more reasonable, doesn't it? Not going quite as fast? Matter of fact, we could tell how much of its bounce is still left if we divided 3.2 by 5. Take 3.2 and divide that by 5, its initial velocity. It only rebounded 64% of its original height. Make sense? So we could tell that pretty much every time. Now, let's look at the next one. In the real world, force pushing an object does not remain precisely constant. That's true, and can change with time. So, force versus time graph. I want you to look. If this is force and this is time, how does this graph relate to impulse? What is impulse? Force times time, isn't it? Well, guys, force times time, if force is on this axis, if time is on this axis, if we wanted to find the impulse, it would be this times this, which is area, isn't it? So the impulse is the area under the curve of a force time graph. You need to know that, that's super important, okay? It's the area under the curve. So all of this here, that area equals the change in momentum or the impulse. So let's find the A, let's find the impulse in five seconds. To do the impulse in five seconds, we need to break this down into two chunks that we can find the area of. This chunk and this chunk. We break it into, into pieces that we can find. So what is the area of the chunk in yellow? How do we find it? What shape is it, guys? It's this rectangle, isn't it? So how do you find the area of a rectangle? Base times height, and the base is what? Two, and the height is? Six. So this is 12. Area in the green, what shape is it? Triangle, one half. What's the base this time? From two to five is what? So base is three, and the height is still what? Six. So half of 18 is, if we add those together, we get 21, and that's the impulse. Kilogram meters per second. Now, how can we use that to answer part B? What do we know about impulse? It is equal to delta P, isn't it? which is MV final minus MV initial. Well, what does it say about MV initial here? Initially at rest, right? So I can zero this part out, can't I? 
So what is my change in momentum? I just found it in part A. So what is my change in momentum? So 21 equals the mass, which is three times the final velocity. So what is the final velocity here? Seven meters per second, all right? Now, if you were in AP Physics C, we'd be looking at this from the standpoint of impulse is defined as the integral of F dt. And for you in calculus, you understand that. It's the area under the curve for a forced time graph. Well, you will. It's the area under a curve. When you get to integrals, it will, this stuff will start making a lot more sense while we tie stuff to area in a graph like this. So now we can find it for that, but if this were a curve defined by a function, we'd have a lot harder time. We'd have to cut it into little slices and add all of them up, and that's what an integral does, okay? Note that this is a force time graph. Force distance graph is distance. Force time graph gives you impulse. Force distance graph gives you work. So be careful, you can make a mistake here, all right? We just looked at force distance graphs. Don't get them confused with force time graphs. So pay attention to the x-axis. So now, momentum is conserved, especially in collisions in one direction. What does it say? If no outside forces act on a system, the total momentum of the system remains constant. Okay? What that means is the force of A on B has to be equal to the force of ball B on ball A. We know that, that's Newton's law, isn't it? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So if that happens over the same amount of time, while they're in contact, think about it. The change in momentum, force times time is the change in momentum, isn't it? So the change in momentum, so let's take this and multiply them both by T. So what we get is the change in momentum of A on B has to be equal to the change in momentum on, of B on A. In other words, momentum is conserved, just like energy is. Okay? Force on ball A is also F by Newton's third law. The forces act on each ball as long as they are in contact. The same force acts on each ball as long as they are in contact. And that's exactly what we're talking about. Law of conservation of momentum. Total momentum of an isolated system never changes. The vector sum of the momentum remains the same, guys. In other words, the momentum final equals the momentum initial, what they start with. This is huge. This is what this whole chapter is about. If there's an external force acting for a time, then the momentum can change. So you need an external force acting for a time for the momentum to change. Think about how true that is. If I push something and it's rolling along, unless I apply some sort of force to either slow it down or speed it up, it stays at the same speed, doesn't it? If something's at the same speed, its change in momentum doesn't change, does it? It's zero. So something at a constant velocity has no momentum. Make sense? No change in momentum. It has momentum, it doesn't have any change in momentum. It has no impulse. You impart the impulse, the impulse is the push or the pull, right? It acts to slow it down or speed it up. So the so the velocity isn't gonna change unless an impulse is applied, an outside force is applied. That's what that means. So let's look at this example. We're almost done here. We could talk about your other stuff for the last 30 minutes of class or so. We have a 60 kilogram skater and a 100 kilogram skater push against one another. So I want you to think about what this is. You got skater one pushing against Skater two, on the ice.
A 60 kilogram skater and a 100 kilogram skater push against one another, don't they? So which one's gonna end up going faster? 60 kilogram person, we know, yeah. We know that just instinctively, don't we? If I'm heavier than you, or here, let's say Blake's bigger than me. If Blake stands here and I stand here, and we're on the ice and I can push against each other, we're sharing the same amount of force, aren't we? Well, if he's bigger, that force is gonna affect my mass. My mass is smaller, so my velocity is going to go up. Makes sense, doesn't it? He's got a bigger mass, so his velocity will be smaller. His change in momentum is the same as my change in momentum. But because his mass is bigger, it affects his velocity less. Okay? So if we push off each other, I'll go shooting this way, and he might just fly a little bit that way. Okay? So it totally makes sense. So you can check yourself using your instincts to see whether or not what you come up with is right. It'll keep you from doing things like missing signs. All right? So suppose the magnitude of the push. So we're given the push. This is our force. We're given our time, which means we know anytime we see force and time, what should we be thinking? What word should come to mind? Impulse. Impulse. And impulse is what? Yep. And impulse, which is change, into, change in momentum. So for part A, here we go. We're going to find impulse, which is F times T. And we're going to set that equal to the change in momentum. So our force is 100. Our time is 2 seconds. And that is going to be MV final minus MV initial. What is their MV initial? Mm -hmm. They were sitting at rest, weren't they? So that's zero. So for each one of the skaters, we can work this problem. We can just put the different mass in for each skater, can't we? So for skater one, we know 200 here is going to be equal to 60 times the final velocity. And for skater two, we know that same 200 is gonna be equal to what? 100 times the final velocity. So what is the final velocity of each one of them? Okay, so 3.3 meters per second and 2 meters per second. But remember, we said velocity is a vector. So one of these has to be negative, doesn't it? So according to my picture, which one's going to be going backwards? Skater one's going to be going this way. So according to my picture, which one gets the negative? Skater one gets the negative, doesn't it? That's because this would have been negative for them, wouldn't it? The force is also a vector. Its force is, the force is pushing him this way. Skater one, two is going this way. So the force is propelling forward this way. So positive two meters per second, but the force is going backwards, which makes it negative, okay? All right, part B, was momentum conserved? Now, to answer this question, you have to ask yourself, was that push an internal or an external to the system? What do we define the system as? If we had to draw a circle around the system, what would the system be? The two skaters, wouldn't it? There's my system. Is the push inside occurring inside that circle? Yes. So the push was an internal force.
for the system. So if it's an internal force, the momentum of the system isn't gonna change, is it? What one skater loses, the other skater picks up, doesn't it? So is momentum conserved? Yes, it is. Now, an example of an external force would be if a third person, these two were standing next to each other and a third person came along and hit them both. Everybody's momentum would, there's two skaters, the momentum would change without them having done anything, would it? That's an external force. So the momentum would not have been conserved for just the two of them. Now for all three skaters, yeah. If you drew this picture a little bit bigger, yes. All right, last example. 75 kilogram man throws a 25 kilogram package at six meters per second from a 100 kilogram boat. The boat is originally at rest. What is the speed of the final speed of the boat? P initial equals P final. That's what we always start with on these, okay guys? So, what is the initial velocity before the package is thrown? The initial is zero, isn't it? So this entire side is zero. What is the final velocity? We've got a man throwing a package, right? So we're gonna have the momentum of the boat plus the package, and we also have the momentum of the package itself as it's going through the air, right? So we have the mass of the boat plus the mass of the pack times the final velocity of both together plus the mass of the package times the velocity of the package to begin with. Okay? Now, this makes less sense to me putting it this way. This is really what's happening. But what I would like to do is have you think about it and it might be easier for you to think about is what's moving. We know in the end, we wanna know about the boat and package, right? They're together at the end. In the beginning, the only thing moving is the Does it make sense, boat or package, boat and package? So this is the mass of the boat plus the mass of the package times the final velocity because they're the thing, they're moving together at the end, aren't they? This is the mass of the boat, velocity of the boat. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I've been doing so well too. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Now, once you think about it, I like it this way best. Yeah. Okay. So what do we know here? We know this is zero. Correct? All right. 
Mass of the package is 25. Velocity of the package is 6. Mass of the boat plus the mass of the package, final velocity. So let's just not even look at it this way and let's look at it from the standpoint of what's moving before the impact versus what's moving after the collision. Does that make more sense to think about it that way? Before collision, after collision. All right, so now we can just divide, can't we? Oh no, hang on, I put something in here wrong, didn't I? Y'all didn't catch me. Does the mass of the dude mean anything? They gave me a 75 kilogram man. Is, that's what, is that the mass? I put the wrong mass in, didn't I? What mass should I have put in? 100, sorry. That's 100, isn't it? So what do we get? Y'all so quiet. I have this air, an air handler up here. I can't hear anything. So 25 times six divided by 125 is 1.2 meters per second. The mass of the man doesn't mean anything. Yeah. That was to throw you off. We've got a package that's moving, hitting a boat that's at rest. That's the part that really matters. Package moving, a boat at rest, that's the initial condition, isn't it? And that's what we saw here. Boat at rest, package is moving, and then in the end, the boat and the package are together because he threw it into the boat, didn't he? Oh no, he threw it from the boat, didn't he? Yeah, it's, it's, funny. it's a morning, guys. He threw it from the boat. So what is the final mass? He's on the boat. Okay, so let's just start all over again. Ugh. Because I screwed this one all the way up, didn't I? All right, so let's actually read the problem this time. So in the beginning, we've got man and package and boat, don't we? All there. In the end, we just have man and boat, no package, correct? So... The boat is stationary, the man is stationary, the package is moving, right? All right, so now we also have to consider, let's picture in our head what's gonna happen. If we have the man standing in the boat, holding the package and he throws the package this way, this is the velocity of the package, correct? What direction is the boat gonna go in reaction? The other way. So this is before, and then after we just have the man in the boat, and the boat is going to be going that way, isn't it? So the man is not moving. So mass of man, boat, velocity of boat, plus mass of package, velocity of package, plus mass of the man, velocity of the man, equals the man, 
plus the boat times the final velocity of both of them together, right? Because the package is no longer on board. The boat's not going anywhere. The van's not going anywhere, is it? What we do know is this package is going forward. It is 25 kilograms and it is going at six. But it is in the opposite direction as him. So we're gonna put minus there. Make sense? Otherwise we have to put the sign in at the end. What is the man plus the boat? 100 plus 75 times the final velocity. Does that make sense to you now, Blake? Now that I actually did the problem correctly, now it makes sense? All right, so it's just gonna change it a little bit. But the sign is gonna go, look guys, you can pay attention to the signs earlier, you can pay attention to the signs after, but one of those velocities has to be opposite the other. Now, if you wanna pay attention to sign conventions, you could have done this, you could have said, all right, I'm not gonna make that negative because my picture shows that positive, so I'm gonna make this negative, okay? It doesn't matter which side you put the negative sign on as long as you realize that one is opposite the other. Are we okay with that? Okay, so now let's divide and figure out what the velocity, the final velocity of the man and the boat together are. So 25 times six divided by 175 is point what? 0.86 meters per second, and it's negative, isn't it? Are we good with that? Okay, that makes sense to me, and that's how I like to look at it, is which direction is everything going, and what's in the beginning, and then after the collision, what's happening, or after the act, what's happening? Okay? All right, guys. We know that the velocity of the package we said was positive, so the velocity of the boat has to be negative. Always check your signs at the end and make sure according to what you picture in your head is actually gonna happen, because your instincts are usually pretty good on these. Make sure that the signs all match what you see happening, okay? Any questions about momentum?